Megan Meyer thinks she's met the boy of her dreams on MySpace. And then one day he turns on her. He's so mean and nasty. She runs upstairs and hangs herself in the closet. The twist comes six weeks later when her parents learn the disturbing truth about her online boyfriend. Let's recap. Thirteen-year-old Megan Meyer has just met her dream boy on MySpace. He's a handsome sixteen-year-old named Josh Evans. Now he and his family have just moved to O'Fallon, Missouri. It's a small city northwest of St. Louis. Meanwhile, Megan lives with her parents in Darden Prairie, another small city. It's about four miles south. Her soulmate Josh is a ten-minute drive up the highway, but these lovebirds will never meet. They talk every other day, but only over MySpace chat. Josh says his family just moved in. They haven't gotten settled yet. They don't have a phone. But Megan's not seeing that massive red flag. All she sees are those cartoon hearts. For Megan, MySpace is a blessing and a curse. She spent her life battling depression, anxiety, ADD. The girls at school tease her about her weight. She never feels like she fits in. MySpace is where the cool kids are. Tina and Ron know the dangers, but they also want their daughter to be happy. So what do you say to a kid who asks for a MySpace page for their 14th birthday? Josh is making Megan smile for the first time in years. So Tina and Ron, they're not about to take that away from her. But then about four weeks later, something changes. Josh turns on her. He begins sending these hurtful messages, telling Megan nobody likes her. The world would be better off without her. Megan spirals. The one good thing in this world just stabbed her in the back. What else is there to live for? It hurts Tina to see her daughter so upset, so betrayed. She wants to give Megan her space, but an overwhelming feeling of dread suddenly strikes. It's the kind of feeling only a mother gets, the kind of feeling that knows when something is horribly wrong. She lunges up the stairs and bursts into Megan's bedroom. She finds her daughter hanging in her closet with a belt tied around her neck. Megan died with a broken heart, but the person who broke it isn't who they claim to be. The Josh Evans isn't real. He was conjured by their neighbor, Lori Drew. Now you might think Lori Drew is a student at Megan's school, but you'd be wrong. Lori Drew is the mother of Megan's ex-best friend. She wanted to know what Megan was saying about her daughter, so she created Josh Evans to catfish this 13-year-old kid. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, you need to properly meet the Myers. So Ron and Tina Meyer grew up in the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri. They'd known each other since the second grade. They even went to prom together. They married shortly after high school. Tina was 19, Ron was 20. Two years later, Megan was born in 1992. But Tina describes Megan as this little chunky thing with an attitude. She loves swimming and boating. She loved dogs, frogs, rap music, and boys. But as Megan got older, Ron and Tina started to worry about her. She'd walk into a room with a big smile and then the slightest thing would send her into this deep depression. In third grade, Megan told her mother she wanted to kill herself. In third grade, her parents took her to a psychiatrist who diagnosed Megan with depression and attention deficit disorder. To treat her depression, Megan was prescribed an SSRI called Celexa. The drug has a documented side effect of contributing to suicidal behavior in children and adolescents who suffer from depression. Kind of doing the opposite there. But according to Tina, Megan always struggled with self-image issues. Even in kindergarten, she complained her legs weren't like the other girls in school. The family eventually moved into a pretty upscale subdivision in Darden Prairie. It's one of those cookie cutter neighborhoods where all the houses look the same, everybody's lawn looks like a golf course. The homeowners association was very strict. Nobody was allowed to have TV antennas, laundry poles, fuel tanks. Dear God, not the above ground pools. You know what I mean. Each home was allowed two pets and fences were frowned on. And that's exactly what the Myers were looking for. By this point, Tina was selling real estate and Ron was a tool and die maker. They wanted a community that thrived on neighborliness. They wanted that Super Bowl party, the barbecues, the cocktails on the patio. This subdivision, this neighborhood was like that for the most part. And then a bitter rivalry began between the Meyer and Drew households. They lived only four houses apart. Megan and Sarah Drew were on-again, off-again best friends. 
Sarah was the obedient one. Megan was the one with the big personality. She was the girl who chased neighborhood boys around with frogs. She also spent a year helping one of her blind classmates get around school. When they were on, Megan would go with the Drews on family vacations. When they were off, the girls hardly spoke. Well, Tina said the girls would be attached at the hip from Friday to Saturday night, but come Sunday morning, Megan needed her space. Sarah took that personally. To her, it was rejection. Her mother, Lori Drew, didn't like that. Well, others around the neighborhood weren't big fans of the Drews. Some described them as local inconveniences. They were like that dog that you complain about when it barks, but you forget about when it's quiet. Well, neighbors described Lori as slightly annoying. She and her husband were the kind of people who'd insert themselves into everything. Some neighbors even had special hand signals to warn when Lori was coming. Though seventh grade is the worst. Am I right? Like the absolute worst, especially for Megan. She tried desperately to fit in with the popular girls, hoping that they'd act as some kind of shield against the boys who were bullying her. Unfortunately, that backfired. The popular girls bullied Megan relentlessly. It got so bad, Tina and Ron had to pull her out of public school. They enrolled her at Immaculate Conception, a private Catholic school with a strict uniform policy. The school was good for Megan. She took up volleyball, she lost some weight, she gained a lot more confidence. She was making new friends, all of whom had MySpace pages. Now this is where Tina and Ron arrive at a crossroads. MySpace allowed Megan to stay connected with her new friends. It also opened the door to online predators, the kind that they'd heard about on TV. Now Megan wanted a MySpace so badly, she was willing to have it as a present for her upcoming 14th birthday. So her parents, of course, finally said yes, but Megan had to follow four strict rules. Tina and Ron had to have the password, she could only log on with their permission. Her page must be set to private and they had the final say over any content she posted. They also wanted to be there whenever she went on MySpace. Well, Megan agreed and she's jumping for joy. She's so excited. Her profile goes live on September 13th, 2006. A month later, she'd be dead. Megan friended everyone from her new school. And then in mid-September, she got a friend request from Josh Evans. Now oh, this guy. He had wavy brown hair, handsome features, big blue eyes. He's 16 years old. He's 6'3". He's got a pet snake. He likes Coke over Pepsi. And he has like a trillion CDs. The New Yorker describes Josh Evans as an online Frankenstein's monster geared to the needs of an insecure, excitable teenage girl. Sounds about right. Well, everything about him was crafted to exploit Megan's emotions. His bio had this sob story about his dad leaving his family when he was just seven. Poor mom, it read. She had such a hard time finding work to pay for us after he left. Under the goal you'd like to achieve this year section of his profile, Josh wrote, meet a great girl. He was looking for someone with long brown hair, like Megan, weight didn't bother him. He wanted a commitment. Megan begs Tina to let her accept Josh's friend request. She agrees, this kid sounds like a decent guy. I mean, it doesn't just work on teenage girls, but she warns Megan, if there's one crossword, delete him. If he's like, hey, hot stuff, God. Is that what the kids are saying? You want to come meet me? Gone. So Megan and Josh chat for the next four weeks. Every message between them glistens with these heart-shaped promises. Sadly, Megan has no idea that Josh Evans is actually a gang of bullies playing a joke on her. Lori Drew, the neighbor mom and the gang's ringleader. Then there's 18-year-old Ashley Grills, Lori's assistant at this coupon book business she runs. And Lori's daughter, Sarah. She also gets in on the action. Because Megan had spent a lot of time with the Drews, Lori knew that she had a MySpace page. She was on antidepressants. She knew what she wanted in a guy. Like she knew everything about this girl. So Ashley set up Josh's fake profile. They figured they could use it to see if Megan was talking about Sarah behind her back. So Lori told a neighborhood mom, Michelle Mulford, about this Josh Evans account. She's like laughing about it, saying she only uses it to mess with Megan. She even gives Michelle's daughter the password and encourages her to join in on the fun. On October 15th, 2006, the first cruel message from Josh to Megan pops up. It reads, I don't know if I want to be friends anymore because I've heard that you're not very nice to your friends. Megan's anxiety 
dials up to 11. So she sends this flurry of responses asking who told him that? Well, the next day, Megan goes to school with invitations to her 14th birthday party. When she gets home, she runs to the computer to see if Josh has said anything else. But Tina doesn't want Megan online, not while she's not home. Her father had worked an early shift and he was napping upstairs. Meanwhile, Tina has to take Megan's little sister to the dentist. So she tells Megan, sign off while I'm gone. Megan says she will, but you know she doesn't. So Tina calls from the dentist's office to check on her. She's crying hysterically. Megan admits that she's still online and Josh's friends are mocking her. They're all ganging up on her, posting things like Megan Meyer is a slut, Megan Meyer is fat. Tina is begging her to get off the computer, but Megan's in too deep. So she starts firing insults back. Josh's final message to Megan is, you're a shitty person and the world would be a better place without you in it. Megan responds, You're the kind of boy a girl would kill herself over. And then she runs up to her room. Well, Ron and Tina are in the kitchen. They're making dinner and they're, you know, talking about how to handle this MySpace thing. And then about 20 minutes later, Tina has this god-awful feeling in the pit of her stomach. She stops talking mid-sentence and runs upstairs to check on her daughter. But Megan is already dead. Michelle Mulford claims her phone rang as ambulances rush to the Meyer home. It's Lori Drew on the other line. She wants to speak with Michelle's daughter. Mrs. Drew said that something happened to Megan and for me to keep my mouth shut about the MySpace page, the girl says. So Lori Drew denies telling the girl to keep quiet. But the Josh Evans MySpace page quickly disappears. Megan's suicide is eating away at Michelle. Six weeks later, she calls Tina and Ron into a meeting mediated by grief counselors. So she delivers the heartbreaking news. Josh Evans was never real. He was a catfish cooked up by Lori and her posse to spy on Megan. But when Tina and Ron get home, they open the garage to see a foosball table that's not theirs. So weeks before Megan's death, they agreed to keep it in their garage for the Drews. It was supposed to be a Christmas gift for the Drew kids. The sight of this giant foosball table they're storing as a favor for these people with what they've just learned sends Tina and Ron into a rage. They grab axes and sledgehammers and they go at the table like wild animals. Then they leave the scraps in Lori's yard with a spray painted note reading, Merry Christmas. Well, the Drews call the police to complain about the damaged table. And that's when the cops learn about this Josh Evans hoax. Until then, everyone just assumed that Megan killed herself because her boyfriend broke up with her. True, but not true. According to the police report, Lori didn't feel as guilty about it because while attending Megan's funeral, she learned the girl tried to commit suicide in the past. Yes, Megan had mentioned suicide, but she never tried to kill herself. At this point, the FBI gets involved, but they tell the Meyer family not to mention anything about it to the Drews or anyone else while they investigate. So Ron and Tina keep it quiet for a full year, still living down the street from these people. Unfortunately, the FBI couldn't recover the last message between Josh and Megan. All they had to go off of was what Ron remembered reading. The laws at the time were not written with cyberbullying in mind. Without anything concrete, the FBI decided not to bring charges against Lori Drew at first. She and her family, however, were crucified in the court of public opinion. A local journalist wrote an in-depth piece about Megan's death, and he revealed that Josh Evans wasn't real, but he never named Lori Drew. The article caught fire, as you can imagine. It spread nationwide as parents grew more concerned about websites like MySpace and now Facebook. Lori's name leaked when CNN accidentally broadcasted the police report she filed after the foosball incident. Girl, you should have let it go. Blogs and other publications took it further, publishing her picture, phone number, address, business. She ran this coupon catalog called the Drew Advantage where local businesses could advertise. Tina allegedly went from shop to shop telling the owners what happened and they shouldn't work with Lori Drew. People threw rocks at their windows, they shot paintballs at their walls, but the justice system wasn't done with Lori Drew quite yet. The state of Missouri didn't have any legal basis to go after her for contributing to the teenager's death. I don't even think they could go that far legally. So federal prosecutors in California stepped in to use the MySpace rules to get her because they made up a fake Josh account, California, because that's where MySpace is based, in the nation's first cyberbullying trial in 2008. Now, Lori was convicted of violating misdemeanor charges in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. However, a federal judge overturned the ruling, saying the act didn't technically cover Lori's behavior as questionable 
awful as it may have been. And as for Ashley and Sarah, well, Ashley took an immunity deal to testify for the prosecution and Sarah wasn't charged. On the bright side, Megan's story led to several new laws around cyberbullying. Unfortunately, the aftermath was too painful for her family to handle. Ron and Tina divorced, both live still with this overwhelming guilt about what happened to their daughter. As Ron sees it, it was Megan's choice to take her own life, but it was like someone handed her a loaded gun. Not someone was Josh Evans, AKA Lori Drew and her posse. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.